Peace and power, Drop Nation, man. What it do, man? We back, man. In Con Drops Corner, man. You know what I mean? I got my corner situated. We good, man. We about to get in that Benjamin of Tadula, man. Peace and power, Tribe, man. Look, man, we've been doing this for a long time, man. We've been on this investigation for a while, man, for for a few years now, man. So I hop to all my, my balcony, you know what I'm saying? Right off the balcony, man, surfing the wave, man. If you've been surfing the wave, man, since since we was right off the balcony, man, you see we came a long way. We're still here, man. We fought many battles, you know what I mean? All praise the creator. We're battle tested, you know what I'm saying? We're proven in this frequency, and our frequency is proven. Remember, man, around here, man, we keep it Torah, all right? We keep our, our mama. We keep wisdom, you know what I'm saying? We we know that we're in the frequency in that 432 we know that we are the indigenous of Maru Khan, man. And we know we ain't spinning on no damn ball. Now, if you vibing with all that, then you can surf the wave, man. You comprehend the fa foundation of our breath, of our secure breath, of our... <sighs> wow! We burn that house down, man. Love to the hot Khan, man. The Guardian, get in that classroom. We gonna vibe up, man. Speaking of the Guardian, man. You see, I got my fresh... Uh, <laughs> see, I got my fresh 24... Utilizing time, man. Shout out to Show Day, man. That's Hiram Jr. I'm going to leave the link, man, to Show Day's, you know what I mean, extravaganza, man. Show Day got a beautiful line of, of of gear, man. He does fashion shows out there in Milwaukee. Love to Hiram Jr., Stephen Jr., man. And, yeah, man, I love this joint, man. He also got some for my children, man. So they all keep all their crystals and all their stuff in here, man. So what's up, Show Day? Appreciate you, man. And yeah, man, we got a few more of these left, man. Get yours. We got a few larges, man, that dodge your own hijacks, man, D-Y-O-H. This is the Drop Nation official. We're going to start, you know what I mean, just experiment with all kinds of drop, all kinds of clothes, all kinds of stuff, man, just to keep keep fresh, man, keep summertime fresh, man. And then in the wintertime, we're going to do all kinds of stuff, man. So we just getting started. But yeah, get it. we got a few left, man, so click the links below. Support the drop, man, and dodge your own hijacks. Love the type battle. This is her slogan, man. <laughs> so the Ether family always gives us inspiration, man, to keep the water flowing, to keep the water flowing, to keep the water flowing, and keep the fire burning. And we also got a couple more of those. If you can't tell us who we are, how can you tell us who we're not, who is pressed to John, I mean, so get in the drop shot, man. A hop to the rooms, a hop to the home team. We're going to be getting on this book today as well, man. Kalei Lose. Yeah, man. Fair use, man. Fair use in your caboose, man. We're going to be looking at this briefly, all right, for scholarship purposes, for the purposes of criticism. This is our classroom. Fair use in their caboose, man. And this is actually the source material for Forbidden Histories of America, man. So it's all good. You don't want us to read your doc. He you took down our entire series, man. He took down over eight, nine videos, man, like 20 hours of research. So don't even trip. We'll be, you know what I mean, getting those back up on our own platform. You know what I mean? We don't got to deal with YouTube and this stuff no more. We're on our way, you know what I mean, doing our dismount. But we got some great series to uh, do our, uh, our a nice little roundup. We're going to do a nice little roundup and a nice little Nadia Komonichi Perfect 10 dismount, man. So I hop to all y'all that's been patient through all this all this uh, wing wham, you know what I'm saying? And we're going to keep our fire burning around here. It's always about the tribe. You know what I mean? The radio, man, is always about the tribe. We always are in the ether. This is where I sit, man, and we just get busy, man. We just get busy. So we got a great show tonight for Turf Thurs, but we're actually going to get into some great links, man, by Jackie Anthony and some of the great home team. That's pretty much what we do on Turf Thurs. Sometimes we got interviews. Sometimes we fall back and just read books, links, man, and drop the dopest independent artists. We always promote great independent artists and music, man. Shout out to Perky Radio, Perky Perspectives, man. She's all about the artists out here, man, in L.A. Gave a nice debut. So we got about 22 shows, man, you know what I mean, or 22, uh, you know, family members, man, uh, you know what I'm saying, hosting shows, and some of them got multiple shows. So we got probably close to 30 radio shows right now in the ether man so all you got to do is go to 432thedrop.com or download the app for free from google play or itunes and you can get it anytime man you just surf the wave there's no analytics there's no statistics no none of that you just fall back you turn it on or you turn it off 
you turn it on or you turn it off, man. Let's go surf the wave, man. Let's go, man. Having a great day, feeling good. No matter what the static is, man. You got people living, you got people dying. You know what I mean? All this stuff is happening, man, but live every day to your best. That's all you can do, man. We don't know what we don't know, but live every day your best, man. Um, you know what I'm saying? Keep your creator first, and that's what's up, man. It's, it's not that hard. It's not that hard to surf the wave. So, yeah, man, you read the title, man. King David walked on water. All right, man, for real, man. King David walked on water. He was known as the Messiah that walked on water. Now, we, we touched on this, you know, briefly in the ether for one of the uh, Press the Hours. I think we're on Press the Hour number 48 in the ether. I got to pick it up right here on YouTube to catch y'all up with what we've been digging on live on the radio. You know what I mean? So, yeah, man, uh, King David walked on water. We're going to get it out of uh, Benjamin and to do love the travels of Benjamin and to do love all right so just pull up the link below and let's go man king david walked on water huh is you playing drop how could it be drop what you mean you saying that david is the messiah david is the messenger that the scepter will never depart that david will return hosea 3 and 5 you're gonna wake up seek your creator and david why are you still seeking david because David is far from just a title. David is far from just a man. You're talking about dragon. You're talking about golden dragons. You're talking about fire, water, air, earth. You're talking about an energy that comes in the form of a David. It's not just one David. The seed is past. The, the, the frame, the shape is past. You know, David is a function. Preston John is a function. It's not just a name. It's a function. Let's go, man. Let's go, man. And yes, this function has always been referred to as Mashiach function because David always brought you to the water. You know what I mean? David's about uniting the kingdom, bringing you to the water, the promised land. Moses is a David by function. You see what I'm saying? Man, love to the temple. I've always been digging on this. I'm going right in, though. I'm going right in, man. Let's go to page. I think it's on 11, man. Let's go. Oh, no, no, no. It's towards the end. Oh, man. David walked on water. Let's get it. So this is an interesting drop, man, from uh, Benjamin of Tadula. And if you haven't got this doc, you know, we at least got pieces of it i don't know if we even got the whole the whole thing man there we go there we go there we go so we on page let's go to page uh 18 man let's go man we're just talking david who they call david l david l let's pick it up right here actually on page Page 17 of this doc. Pull it up, man. You get it. You got it. You and Khan drops corner, man. You got the drop, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pause it. Read it. Read it yourself. Read it yourself. This is out the travels of Benjamin at the Dula. So these are, uh, I guess, somewhat, you know, little known manuscripts you know what i'm saying we got the ones that you know what i'm saying we're told to read you know what i mean but then you got you got the drop you know what i mean you got the ones that you got to dig up you know what i mean you got the ones that are going to connect things for you and benjamin of Tadula is one of them uh manasseh ben israel is another one we got both of those uh in the drop library again love to aqua Tag battle she's taking over the library be patient with us as we frame and shape it a lot's going on you know, but we're making time more and more to crystallize these environments, the drop library. I'm still building a dragon room. Love to the dragon sponsors on the wall. So far, we got six or seven dragon sponsors, man. So we're trying to get 600, you know what I mean? Because all that goes to the Ether Squad so that they can build together, we can build together, buy more land, seal more land, build more land is our purpose. 
support it, become a Dragon sponsor on the wall, go to 432thedrop.com or click the link below because we got to get there. Who, who got us there? Who got us there? The function got us there. Ten years ago, there rose a man of the name David L. Well, they say David L. Roy of the city of Amari. Look, man. Come on, man. Now, they're going to put this place in India, right? When you look up Amari, you got it, you got it. I know it's small. You pause it, you read it. All right? So, we talk about Amari, David L. Roy of the city of Amari. All right? All you got to do is put a C right before that A. You got to marry Ka, Amari Ka. Change that A to an E. I mean, you see what the game is. So, you surf the wave. Is this place... You know, some small place in, in India. I mean, I looked it up right here. It says, where is Amaria? And it says it's in a place called Uttar. Uttar Pradesh, India. All right. All right. So, are we talking Uttar Pradesh in India over there? Or are we talking about India Superior since we know that this is also called India on maps and it's called India Superior. We know we're talking about Presser John, David, right, of the three Indies. Where was he really rocking at? They want to say, oh, he's, he's king of the Indians. He's king of India, so we're only going to put him in the India you know so you don't got to ask no questions because if we put him in Amarika, Amaria, oh, we got problems. Oh, we got problems. So let's get it, man. Ten years ago, there arose a man named David L. Let's go. Of the city of Amaria. Let's go. Who had studied under the prince of captivity. His die. His die. His die. Now, his die, or has die, his die, or has die, you start to connect that with scripture. You start, you start to connect the has die. In the script, we're going to connect some of that, but we're only just talking about exilarchs. We're talking about the prince of the captivity, which is what? An exilarch. Let's just look at what an exilarch is. Let's just look at the definition, man. Exilarch, the leader of the Jews of the Babylonian exile. Now, we're also going to touch on chronology today, because when they say Babylonian exile, and again, love to the Templar, you say, well, damn, how long was this Babylonian captivity, G? Because they want us to go back to the B.C.s or, I mean, you know, what, early A.D.s or something like that, or we're still talking exilarchs. Has died, right? His die, has died. Well, they say born 1302, and he's still an exilarch. So is it possible, based on chronology, which we're going to touch on, knowing that they added over a thousand years, a thousand years to all you Nagas on all native lands, was the Babylonian captivity more recent? I mean, does it have anything to do with the Genghis Khan takeover? In the 1200s, and then would that be leading up to the 1300s and the Exilarch, the leader of the Jews, his die? Now, some of these pieces aren't going to fit exact, but they're going to give you enough to keep searching. And all we're going to do is really inspire the search, inspire the water to keep flowing. Let's go back, man. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's just go back. Let me read the story to you about... The Messiah, David, walking on water. So that when the Christians come along and they remix this stuff, you know where they're getting it from. Alright, you have sources outside the Bible, outside the tampering, to say, whoa, there's something here, there's something to add up here, there's something going on here. I've never heard of David walking on water. Nobody talks about David walking on water. But if David walks on water, and if Jesus is called the Messiah, and he's walking on water as if it's some original miracle. But when is this really take? when is all this taking place? All right, when is this Jesus story really taking place, man? All right, let's go, man. So, 
What do we got? Ten years ago, there arose a man named David L. of the city of Amaria who studied under the Prince of Captivity, or the Exilarch, has died, right? Right here. Pause it. Read it. Has died. Has died. Has died. Has died. All right. Let's go. So he studied under his die and under Eli, the president of the College of John, John, Jacob. Uh, College of Jacob, you know, let's go. John, look at the John, look how they spell John, right? G-E-O-N, like the Jahan, like Jahan River. So sometimes they spell John with a G. So when you have a river like Jahan, it's just John or Wang, King, Khan. Let's go. So this David L studied under his die, the Exilarch, all right, the Prince of Captivity. That's what an Exilarch is, right? Exilarch, the leader of the Jews of the Babylonian exile. All right. Now this term was applied by Greeks to the head of a community of Jews in a diaspora. All right, so the Greeks called in whoever was leading the Israelites an exilarch, especially during this Babylonian exile or Babylonian captivity. Now this particular David became an excellent scholar, being well versed in the Mosaic law. So he kept the law. All right, so this is a real David keeping the laws of Moses in the decisions of the rabbis and in the Talmud understanding also the profane sciences the language and the writings of the Mohammedans and the scriptures of the magicians and enchanters so this David understood it all does that got anything to do you know what I mean with the Nestorian renowned for wisdom renowned for wise counsel like Solomon knew so much Solomon is also a David David is a title he passes it on even Solomon is a David so these are wise kings right so they know it all it says understanding all what they're calling the sciences the profane sciences uh, the languages and writings of the Mohammedans so he understood all that and the scriptures of the magicians the magi and enchanters man which is just you know what I mean? The secret, you know what I mean? The secret energies, the secret, uh, uh, what they call them, um, what they call them, uh, sciences, uh, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? High science groups, secret groups, you know, that, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, in these, in these, in these groups that teach this high sciences, whatever they call them, these languages and writings and Mohammedans and the scriptures of the Magi and Enchanters, he made up his mind to rise in rebellion against the king of Persia. Now this Persia is what? Babylon, right? Persia, Babylon, Babylonian captivity, David. Now you're going to have to come in your head and say, this is something separate. You know what I mean? Or you're going to have to say, this is the real David we're reading about. Now, when is this taking place? This is written by Benjamin of Tadula. When did Benjamin of Tadula write this? Let's see, man. Let's do some recon. Yeah, man. Benjamin of Tadula. Date. Now, in Wikipedia, it says Benjamin of Tadula, Hebrew, all right, I'm calling him a Hebrew, of medieval Jew, was a medieval Jewish traveler who visited Europe, Asia, and Africa in the 12th century. All right, man. All right, man. So if it's in the 12th century, we're talking about the 1100s. If we're talking about the 1100s, we got to, you know, make sure we're on top of our chronology. Let's check that out right quick. 
mystery, mystery side, mystery schools. That's what I was like, man. What they call them in Egypt, the mystery schools. So David, you know, knew all the mystery, all the all the mystery sciences from the mystery schools, right? Just like Solomon. Now, when is this taking place? 1100s. Let's, let's check out this chronology, man. Pull the link up. And let's talk chronology, man. Who lost the Middle Ages? Pull this link up right quick and we'll finish this walk on water story. Pull that link up. Let's go. Give me alkaline. Let me get my alkaline. Get you a coppers, man. I don't know. I mean, it's been working for me. I, you know, I still want, I still want one of them old, you know, old fashioned joints, but Amazon, man, you know what I mean? Now, what's behind the attempt to impose a new chronology on history? Let's go. I'm going to jump right down. Now, we know about Antonio, Antoni, Anatoly, Fermenko. Now, Fermenko begins by telling his readers that English history is flawed and broken. That we, we overstand. Let's go. He argues that the source text used to create our understanding of Britain from the Roman occupation to William the Conqueror are all misstated. Again, Formanco, Anatoly Formanco, look up Anatoly Formanco, begins by telling his readers that English history is flawed and broken. Now, this is a Russian chronographer, you know, dealing with dates and history, and he's putting together what they're calling a new chronology, which we know is just the, the real spill. He's, he's realizing how much time's been added, and when they add time, that means they're pushing your history back. So before they were talking about the time shifts, which we're about to read about, they said one time shift happened, they pushed our history back 333 years. Another time shift, they pushed it back 1,053 years. They actually sat down and did this. They actually sat down and did this shit. Why? To disconnect you from your history. Why? Because psychologically, it makes you indifferent because it happened in the BCs. Then you say, well, ain't no way we still the same people. We've been mixed around and mixed up so much. Ain't no pure Israelites around. Look here, my naga. Do you think these white people intercepted every single Naga seed that got, you know, put into a, a Naga woman's womb? Just because they came and did their, you know, malice, you know what I'm saying, did their, you know, uh, mutilation, genocide on our people. Just because they came and raped our mothers and our sisters and our daughters, our aunts, just because they put their hijacked seed in them. Does it mean that they hijacked the seed of the Naga? Remember, your seed still plays. Don't fall for these stories, man. You are still the pure water. Because how can they intercept every single Naga seed? What, did they just somehow create an invention to stop all Nagas from being with another Naga? One Negro or so-called Negro, one copper color Hebrew from being with another copper color Hebrew and just intercept all the seeds before they go to the womb? Hell nah. You know you were still making love to your women. You know you were still making love to your women. And then they had a son that made love to them. You know what I mean? So the seed continues, man. Ain't no way they inter intercepted even remotely half of all Naga seeds, man. They just put their own mix in. Yeah, we know that, but that don't mean that we all got mixed out because of their seed. We still got daddies that's Nagas that come from daddies that's Nagas that come from daddies that's Nagas. When did they see, when did that got to interrupt that? You know what I mean? So, yeah, you can accept, you know, uh, you can accept truth to a degree of the mixing, but not even near, not even near the level of the interception rate. They got to be Deion Sanders around here just picking, picking off Jerry Rice, you know what I mean? I just watched some uh, some highlights, man. You know, if you just want to fall back, 
and appreciate some. Go watch some Derry, uh, 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 Deion Sanders, Jerry Rice, you know, head to head, you know, matchups, man. It's pretty, you know, what I mean, elite. It's elite. It's it's an elite level of uh, physical activity, man, going on, man, between those two, uh, you know, beasts at what they do. But anyway, man, they didn't intercept your seed. They didn't intercept your seed. They couldn't intercept your seed. Yeah, the time shifts happen. So they pushed our timelines back. But when it's a lot closer, then that interception ain't really even relevant no more because it just happened. It just happened. Look, man, let's go, man. Let's go, man. For the Manko begins by telling his readers that English history is flawed and broken. He argues that the source text used to create our understanding of Britain from Rome, occupation, or America, to William the Conqueror, all that, are all misdated. Quote, in correct version, ancient and medieval English events are to be transferred to the epic which begins from the 9th to 10th I'm about to throw this cop I'm about to throw some copper hope this ain't ain't no kids hope my children ain't, ain't around I'm about to throw some copper man look man we're talking about King David relative to time now time is relative all in itself you know time is electromagnetism right Incorrect version. Ancient and medieval English. Medieval. Someone's calling it evil, right? Medieval. Because they're talking about the Naga. They demonize you. They call you a savage. And you're medieval. So these medieval events that's really taking place in the 1200s, 1100s, 13, 14, all that. That's what they're calling medieval. These events are actually in the correct version to be transferred to the 9th, 10th centuries. At least. So when you go back and watch that for the Manco drop that we, you know, drop, you know what I mean, with those, you know, scholars talking about their research, then what they're telling you that all that what you consider ancient history should be transferred to around the 900s. And they said most of it happened even after that. They said 300s, most of it happened after the 900s. So now we get to what? 1100s. So when is the birth of Jesus? Based on their research, they said it happened in either 1054 AD or 1154 or 53. And some even pushed the Jesus birth to 1253. <laughs> You got to, you know, surf the wave, you know, go back to the true chronology series, physics of our creator. Uh, is it that one? Yeah, the true chronology. We breaking all that down. You know, hopefully we get some of that right here. But let's at least start with the time shift, because if they're dating the birth of Jesus or Joshua, right? Hawashua, love to hire Mark, cutting through that Caesar's Messiah, putting it together with the chronology then there's a Messiah that was born according to, you know, their Bethlehem star and all that. They use the astrological, you know, dating and signs and they say, look, the only time these stars are lining up the way that they're saying it in the script is in the 10, I think they said 1053 or 1054. And some push it to 1153, some push it to 1253. Either way, even if you go off the 1053, then there's a Messiah that's being born around this time in around 1050. Around 1050 AD. There's a David being born. There's a Messiah being born. There's a Joshua being born. Joshua still carries this function of a David, of a Mashiach. Let's go. So these English medieval events you know what I mean, or whatever they want to push back, should be transferred to the 9th, 10th centuries. Moreover, many of these events prove to be the reflections of certain events from real Byzantine Roman history of 9th to 15th century, man. 
Pause it, man. Pause it, man. There you go. Yeah, man. Get the drop. We're just reading these paragraphs. Let's go. Again, we're reading from J. Colavito dot tripod dot com click the link this has to do with these lost civilizations right you lost right now they said 9 to 15 centuries so a lot of what we're thinking is in the BC's or early AD's is really happening more recently whether you're talking about uh, you know what I'm saying Jerusalem 70 AD Titus Vespasian all that just change the titles and see what really went down you just got invaded Jerusalem was just taken down by Titus or Columbus or Genghis Khan. I mean, you choose your invasion, but whatever invasion they're talking about in 70 A.D. or, you know, whatever's happening in 30 A.D. with this Jesus character is really happening with Joshua and when? Between the 9th and 15th centuries or 1053, 1054. 1100s, 1200s was adding up to who? Kitsukoto, who they're calling priest king here. And that's why the Mormons had to claim Kitsukoto because they knew this was the real Mashiach and they called him Jesus. And they said, oh, who they're calling Kitsukoto is the real Jesus. And the Mormons will tell you that. So if they're claiming, if the Mormons are claiming Kitsukoto as Jesus, then you with a dragonfly perspective can claim Kitsukoto as Joshua, not not Zeus, right? Joshua, which brings you back into your Meshi, your Mesex, your Mashiachs, your tribes of Moses. And our next Preston John is going to be a banger. I mean, because we're going to get back into the Rechabites. We're going to get back into the Rechabites and how these are the connection of the tribes of Moses that's being hidden in the script. And I can't wait to drop that probably next, man. So let's go. So according to Fermenko, there were originally four sources of historical knowledge. Books, which he refers to as A, B, C, and D. The latter three were imperfect copies of A, the true history. So we're talking about the true chronology, the true history. Over time, they were copied and recopied each became so garbled that the four books were eventually assumed to be four separate histories or they purposely separated them and created phantoms and duplicates just to confuse you today in history class. So they became four separate histories rather than flawed copies of one narrative. Therefore, when late medieval scribes set about writing history, they accidentally, or on purpose, we already know, made history four times longer than it should have been by repeating the same history four times. <coughs> Come on, man. So they made history four times longer than it should have been, which means what? They pushed your ass back. They pushed your priest king back. They, 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 they pushed David back 300 years. You're going to find a Preston John. 1,053 years, you're going to find another Preston John. 1778, you're going to, 1800 years, you're going to find another David, another Preston John. But it's all coming from book A, which is your true history, which is happening when? Between the 9th and 15th century. Now you realize you just got invaded. Now you realize that the real King David was said to fall, Preston John was said to fall by the invasion of Genghis Khan in 1202. 1203 and everything got switched around from that point on now we're in shambles now it's really more and more because we're it's con on con someone is literally stealing the con Preston John's nephew or foster son Genghis Khan King David's foster son who wanted to marry all of King David's daughters to his people King David said I'm insulted that you would ask to marry my family we are a distinct bloodline, a distinct, and you know that. We took you in, Genghis. We took you in, but you want to be the con that bad. That even though we took you in, you now want to be a part of the family that bad. He said, hell no. Genghis Khan said, well, let's go to war for it. 
and he he came with his dragons and his his uh sorcery right and Preston John had his and he said no one seen Preston John fall no one saw Preston John get killed just the rumors were that he was killed by friendly fire he was killed by Naaman soldiers and the Naamans fought with the Israelites we talking about the Franks the Naamans the Dans you know what I'm saying Israelite war against Genghis Khan and his misfits All right, but they came and according to the Most High the kingdom fell the kingdom fell let's go but when did it fall when did it fall you know what I mean what timeline are you gonna rock on because you are gonna have to start to see clearly we're talking about the copies of a book a the true history over time they were copied and recopied each became so garbled that the four books were eventually assumed to be four separate histories rather than flawed copies of one narrative the real spill therefore when late medieval scribes said about writing history they accidentally or you already know they made history four times longer than it should have been by repeating the same history four times for the man go believes this account for similarities or duplicates he has found in the different periods of human history more importantly this discovery allows him to reconstruct the true history by collapsing the four histories into a few hundred years so putting Humpty Dumpty back together again seeing how they separated it and made it super long same thing with Egyptian chronology just to add to something so you don't get the real spill that you're living in the old world and that you are the Hebrews you are the kingdom that was invaded in 70 AD except it's happening in when the 1400s the 1200s Genghis Khan then Columbus let's go he calls for the Manko calls this compressed version remember he took four histories merged them into a few hundred years where they belong he calls this compressed version the fibrid or fiber structure chronicle we're getting back into the fibers or the fringes fringes are fibers let's go the three chronicles BC and D which are the what the phantoms the duplicates were embedded into a by considering each one as a rigid block and shifting them forward by approximately 333 1053 and 1778 years respectfully how did Fermenko decide how far to shift these dates the answer goes to the heart of why his theory makes little sense he says he decided to apply his knowledge of advanced mathematics to the study of history he began by studying the astronomical phenomenon recorded in Ptolemy's al a text from the second century CE using this eccentric interpretation skipping down a little bit for the man who proceeds to declare that on this basis all historical chronology is wrong the Roman Empire he claims actually began in the ninth century so clearly his authors taking you know oh man you know this 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 doesn't make sense to me but you know we've been digging all the recons so I want to show you you know something that's you know writing in they're very skeptical as a lot of people are because they just wanna once your mind is trained once you think you're on a certain timeline it's very difficult what did the matrix say it's very difficult to unplug somebody after a certain amount of time so they gotta hold on to the lie they gotta go they gotta hold on to the fake history fake time fake chronology but research for the Manco he's saying the Roman Empire actually began in the ninth century and its eastern half called the Byzantine was the true model for all history the Byzantine right so we're talking Turkey right we're talking uh, uh, Khazaria Cappadocia we're talking Mazaka or Moses the founder remember the document we're gonna get back into that with Moses Mosak Meshach so Moses the founder before it was called Cappadocia or Khazaria or the Khazars the original Khazars are the Mexicans or the Mazakans 
tribes of Moses were in Turkey, where the Byzantine Empire. So when Prester John is writing his letter, he sends it to Manuel, right? At that time, he's the exilarch or the king of the Byzantine Empire. So he's writing to his people in Byzantine when he's writing the Prester John letter originally. The Byzantine Empire was taken out in 1453, one year after the Papal Bull, 1452. So it was a direct target of the Papal Bull. It was a direct hit by the Papal Bull. Why? Well, from Manco is saying, you know, regardless of how you rock and where you rock, do your recon and, and dig on it yourself, that the Byzantine was the true model of all history. Man, let's go. So we're going to dig more on that. We got, you know, that, especially with the uh, Joshua being born in 1053 or 1153 or 1253. Keep all this in mind when you see these dates about to start popping up. What Joshua was born in 1053? Let's go back to this date. Let's go back to Benjamin of the Dula. King David walked on water. Now that we have a sense of chronology, we can start to flow. Ten years ago, there rose a man of the name David L. L. Roy of the city of Amarica, right, Amaria, who had studied under the Prince of Captivity, his die or has died, and under Eli. Let's go. Who became an excellent scholar, being well versed in the Mosaic Law, in the decisions of the rabbis, Talmud, understanding all the sciences, languages, and writings, right? The the mystery schools, the mystery systems of the Mohammedans and the scriptures of the magicians and enchanters. He made up his mind to rise. Quam Shabbata. Rise. He made up his mind to rise in rebellion against the hijack, against Babylon, right? Against the king of Persia to unite and collect the Hebrews who live in the mountains of Kaftan. Kaftan, C-H-A-P-H-T-O-N. And with them to engage in war with all Gentiles. I'm not making this up. This is King David, hijack free. Read it. Pause it. He went to war against all Gentiles, man. Then we just read about, man, tune in, all right? Every Tuesday night, we're reading this book right here. All right, we do readings on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. On Tuesday, we read this book, The Black Jacobins, The Two Summer Overture Revolution. You see all this stuff happening in the 1600s, and you're realizing, well, this stuff here, we're reading, is probably happening in the 12, 1300s, so these are exilarchs. Toussaint Leoverture is another exilarch leading his Hebrew people against what? All Gentiles. All hijacks. Let's go. So that's Tuesday. Monday, we're reading this right here. American Holocaust. You already know, man. We've been in this, man, for years. But we're reading all these from cover to cover. I do my best just to have a straight reading, but sometimes, man, Ruach got to flow. Ruach got to flow. And on Wednesday, we got this one popping with Jack Forbes, uh, Africans, Native Americans, you know what I mean, language of races, man. We got all these popping off for you, man, and a lot more to come, man. We got a lot more to come, man. Let's go. <laughs> so, David, all right, King David, decides to rise, rise against the hijack and engage in war with all Gentiles making the conquest of Jerusalem his final object. He gets so it's all about the promised land, right? With this David. He gave signs to Jews. He gave signs to Jews. And they say by false miracles, but we we about to see if these miracles were false or not. And assured them, quote, the Lord has sent me to conquer Jerusalem and to deliver you from the yoke of the Gentiles. So by calling it a false miracle, that's somebody's conjecture that, oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe he walked on water. I don't believe he turned himself invisible. Invisible, magic ring, Shambhala, Prester John, magic mirror, 
Yeah, we about to dig on that too. I told y'all, man, we get in chronology. We're gonna get on this Calais loose. You know, this is Con Drops Corner, man. Peace and power to the tribe to eat the squad for keeping the water flowing because you are supplying Drop Nation, man, with so much of this Hawata. So, David, it's all about securing the promised land, going to war with all hijack. He said, Hawa sent me to conquer Jerusalem to deliver you from the yoke, from your captivity, right? Some of the Jews did not, did believe in him and called him Messiah. So at first they say he got false miracles going on. Then he say that he's being called Messiah. Some of the Jews believed in him and called him Messiah. Now what does this Messiah do? Let's go. When the king of Persia became acquainted with the circumstances he sent and summoned David into his presence, the later went, the latter went without fear. So David had no fear. He said, man, what'd it do? <laughs> and when brought before the court, he was asked, Are thou the king of the Jews? Man, pause it, man. Are thou the king of the Jews? Now, what does it say? When they say they killed Jesus and they said, oh, they, they, they put him on the cross and under it it said, what? King of the Jews. He's called Messiah. David's called Messiah. We, we already know we got script on script on script to back up the fact that David is called Messiah. And to not. David has this function. David is said to return. Hosea 3 says you're going to search for your creator and David once you return. Nothing about Jesus. David, who has the scepter, priest king, who's not just a man, who is also a dragon. But let's go. <laughs> you are the cons. Let's get it. So when we talk about David, we're talking about the king of the Jews, right? The king of the Israelites, right? Let's go. King David, right? So he says, aren't you the king of the Jews? This is why we say, even though they say David L, this is King David. Because what does he say? I am. Are you the king of the Jews? To which he made answer and said, I am. Yeah, come on, man. Pull it up. I am. Wow. So they asked him to his face. He says, this is from Benjamin of Tadula, the travels of Benjamin of Tadula, talking 1100s, 1200s. All right, this is not something that someone's trying to push on you. You're not being indoctrinated with this information. This is what's coming out. As Daniel said, the books will be unsealed. We just got that Erectology about how Daniel actually sealed the books by transferring the, the letters, the Hebrew letters, from the Paleo to the Chaldean flame letters. And some somehow with that transfer sealed the book. And you say, well, when did that happen? Well, if this is happening 11, 12, 1200s, 12 then Daniel could easily be in the 1300s, 1400s, whenever these Chaldean flame letters are now being transferred as what we're calling modern Hebrew. So you can't get a hijack nothing, man. They didn't invent nothing. They didn't even invent the modern Hebrew. According to that Erectology drop, go get it on YouTube. We've been dropping it in the ether. David, Daniel himself made that particular switch to the flame letters to seal the book so you couldn't get the full comprehension that you would get in the paleo. The books are being unsealed. Are you the king of the Jews, David? He says, I am. I am King David. Upon this, the king of Persia immediately commanded that he should be secured and put into prison where the captives are kept who are in prison for life. <clears throat> so we read about Moshe being thrown in a dungeon by his father-in-law, right? Jethro, right? But then we're reading about Reuel, his real father-in-law. Ty Battle got a book saying that Reuel was actually an Edomite. We'll come back to that. <laughs> and now, Moses being thrown in the dungeon. You know Daniel was thrown in the dungeon. 
Now you got King David who's being put in prison for life. Let's go. Situated in the city of Dabaristan on the banks of Kazil Ozian, which is the broad river. After a lapse of three days, when the king sat in council to take the advice of his nobles, so David was thrown in, excuse me, yeah, King David was thrown in prison. How many days? Let's count. What did he say? After three days. You already know, you already know where this is going. Keep the Jesus story in mind, man, so you can see the phantom duplicates, man. <laughs> the books are being unsealed for a reason, man. Keep, keep Zeus in mind for a second. Let's go. After a lapse of three days, when the king sat in council to take the advice of his nobles and officers respecting the Jews who had rebelled against his authority, King David appeared among them, having liberated himself from prison without human aid. No human aid, they say specifically. Do you see the correlation? King David was put in jail for life. That's his life. He's there for life. They put him there to die, right? Jesus died and rose up in three days. King David's King David died, he's put in jail for life, and he gets out in three days without human aid. Pause it, man. I mean, you got to read it for yourself. Benjamin of Tadula. Pause it and read it. Will the real David please stand up? Will the real Mashiach please stand up? So now David is now put in jail for life. He rises in three days. What happens next? Can't make this shit up, man. After a lapse of three days, all right, David appeared among them, having liberated himself from prison without human aid. When the king beheld him, he inquired, Who has brought you here? <laughs> or who has set you free? To which David made an answer and said, my own wisdom, my own mama, mama did it, man. Wisdom, mama, Shekinah, my own wisdom. Who set you free after three days, King David? My own mama, my own wisdom and subtlety. For verily I fear neither you nor your servant. This is heartbone season. No fear was involved in his liberty. King David said, I fear not you, even though you're the king of kings of Babylon. We're talking about the exilons, right? We'll get back to it. We'll, we'll get back to this has died. So, having liberated himself, right? He says, My own wisdom freed me, my own mama. For verily, man, I don't fear you nor any of your peoples, man. All right. The king immediately commanded that he should be seized. And his servants answered and said, We see him not. Where did he go? Which way did he go? Which way did David go? Did David did, did King David just disappear into the thin air? Oh, these are false miracles. Did the brother just disappear? Let's keep reading, man. <laughs> so the king of Persia immediately commanded that David be seized, but his servants answered and said, We see him not, and are aware of his presence only by hearing the sound of his voice. So he disappeared, and now only because of the sound of his voice. Alright. This is getting good. This King David, I'm rocking with this day. I'm rocking with this David, and in the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s, I'm rocking with this King David. Let's go, man. I ain't rocking with the Genghis Khan takeover King David. Because, again, Genghis Khan also called himself David. He called himself King David after he took the Khan. He also took the title David. So we're reading out of this book right here. Preston John, the legend and his sources, dropped on us by the battle family. Love to the battles. You see a king on a on a horse you, you see a knight 
right? You're talking about Priest, King, Prester John, the Knight, the Naga. And in case you don't know, we're talking about the Naga. They gave you a nice little Naga picture of El Prete Juan, the red, the red, the red, the Naga, the Knights, the Naga Knights, right? The Prester John. So they break it down. Let's go. They break down the Genghis Khan takeover beautifully from lots of different sources. How Genghis Khan started calling himself King David. We know that King Charlemagne called himself David as well. Let's go, man. Everybody's taking the title. Everybody want to be a David. But now it's, now it's a myth. Now it's mythology, right? Well, he disappeared. They said, we see him not, boss. Boss, we see him not. <laughs> and are aware of his presence only by hearing the sound of his voice. The king was very much astonished at David's exceeding sub subtility. Right? Or just, you know, intelligence, all that. Who thus addressed him, I now go my own way. So David now says, only they see his voice. Remember, he's invisible. He says, I now go my own way. And he went out, followed by the king and all his nobles and servants, to the banks of the river where he took his shawl. You know, his, uh, you know, shawl that you wrap around like a fabric. Where he took his shawl, spread it on the water, and crossed it thereupon. I'll read it again. They couldn't see David, right? They said, we see him not, boss. Boss, where'd he go? They heard his voice. We can only, we can, we can only, we, we're only aware of his presence only by hearing the sound of his voice. Then David says, I now go my own way. And he, and he went out, followed by the king and the nobles. So everybody followed the voice, all right? To the banks of the river, all right, where he took off his shawl, spread it on the water, and crossed it. Ain't this way better than the Jesus story? Oh, Jesus is walking on water, man. King David went invisible first. And then took off his invisible shawl. And then started crossing the water on his shawl. Right? And then what? And then what, boss? King David's walking on water. He crossed it. And at that moment, he became visible. So he turned back to visible, to visibility, once he was on the water so that they can witness the miracle, which is only up to the beholder. If it's a real miracle or false miracle, they could say the same thing about the Jesus story, right? But... According to Benjamin of Tadula, is going down. At that moment, he became visible, and all the servants of the king saw him cross the river on his shawl. So all these witnesses saw him walking on water. He was pursued by them in boats, but without success, and they all confessed. Listen up, this is what the king of Persia and all the nobles and servants are saying about King David. In the 1100s. Because remember. Who is Preston John? We're going to get it. If Genghis Khan rolled up on Preston John in 1202 or 1203. They say it. That means that this David must have been born in the 1100s. That means that when they say that this Jesus. According to the astronomical signs. And all the research by Anatoly for the Manko. And all the chronographers in Russia. They're putting together the true chronology, right? The book A, they're putting A, they're merging it back together. They're saying the significant history is happening around this Byzantine. The, the significant history is happening between the 9th and 15th century. So when we're putting this back together, they're saying, man, that they watched him cross and walk on water. This David must have been born around the same time as the real Joshua, which is all putting it all together. <laughs> Remember, they've been put. Man, 
right? They 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 gave us these stories, right? We got them, we got them, but the wave that is being served with crew con- true chronology is that they're not like separate historical events. A lot of these people might be the same people or the same, you know, events being told from different sides with different titles. They might be switching the name of the kings. You know, David and Moses could be the same person as far as we know. You know what I'm saying? Joshua, same thing. You know what I mean? All this stuff is all connected. You know what I mean? So we see it as separate timeline, chronological events. But when you put them back together, you see where the phantoms and duplicates are taking place. And that, you know what I'm saying, we can do our best once these, you know, stories are published for us in English to figure it out. Even when we got, you know, some Hebrew on it, you know what I'm saying? Even when we can, you know, dig on some of this modern Chaldean. But there's a reason why the books were sealed. There's a reason why it's all coming to light. And you got to ask the question. So they're watching David cross this water, walk on water. The king saw him cross the water, the river, on his shawl. He was pursued by them in boats, but without success. And they all confessed that no magician, no magician upon earth, could equal him, could equal David. No magician. You know what I mean? The Magi. Nestorian, right? Nestor, old king, renowned for wisdom. No one can equal him. They all confessed. All of Persia, Babylon, right? Same way that this corporation will have to confess that no one can equal the magic, the power, of the Naga, all praise Hawah, of the Nagush, of the Khan. Let's get it. There's a reason why you seek your creator and David and the priest king and the Presta Khan, the Presta John. So he was pursued. They all saw him and they said, man, no, no magician on earth could equal him. And it says, he that very day traveled to Amaria, or Marika, depending on how you surf, a distance of 10 days journey by help of the Shem Ham Faraj, and related, to the, and related to the astonished Jews or Hebrews, all that happened to him. Then the king of Persia afterwards sent to Emir El Mumini, the caliph of Baghdad, principal of the Mohammedans to solicit the influence of the Prince of Captivity and of the presidents of the colleges in order to check the proceedings of David. So they wanted to check David. They wanted to get back at David. And they threatened to put to death all the Jews, all the Hebrews. They threatened to put to death all the Israelites who inhabited his empire. They said every Israelite inhabiting the empire of Prester John, right? King David, right? What's the Papal Bull 1452 about? What was Genghis Khan about <laughs> in 1200s? To check the proceedings of King David. Genghis Khan wanted to check King David. They want to check King David. Can we put all this history back together? And threaten to put to death all Jews who inhabited his empire. So we got King David going invisible. They say, which way did he go, boss? We don't know where he went. Then he says, man, I now go my own way. They go out. They follow him to the banks of the river, banks of the water, where he took off his shawl and walked on water. Then he became visible again just so that they could witness it. And they said, man, ain't nobody got the juice like this. Ain't nobody got the drop on David. He's the coldest mad job we ever seen on earth. So you know he's Hebrew. You know he comes from the Eber. You know he comes from the flow, from the con. You know he's the priest king. King David's walking on water, man. You pull it up now. Like I said, he went invisible. He went invisible. What does this got to do with Preston John, the priest king? Man, pull up this book right here. Shambhala, the fascinating truth behind the myth of Shangri-La. Chef Candy dropped this on us, man, you know, a few months ago, man. This is how long we've been researching this. Uh, this is by Victoria LePage. It should look like this. Pull up this link. <coughs> wow. All right, man. Almost almost at the dismount. Let's get a few more. We're going to dismount 
this great Kalelu's book talking about the artifacts, right? The Roman Jewish or the Romani Hebrew colony. And that's what that author, Daniel Lowe, had an issue was that we saw the drop. We're talking Roma or in Hebrew it's Rimon, R-I-M-A-N, Rimon, which is pomegranate, which is Granata, Granada. Pomegranate, pomegranata, granata, pomegranate, pomegranata. When Joshua and Caleb come back, they come back with the pomegranate, right? Which is the real apple of Carthage, the real apple. When you're talking about the garden of Eden, the apple, you're talking about the pomegranate, which symbolizes the promised land and so much more. So much more, man. We're going to get on these Romani. Let's go. So in that book, Shambhala, The Fascinating Truth Behind the Myth of Shangri-La, it says some esoteric societies have always been aware of this Gnostic uh, substratum beneath the orthodox veneer of history. Thus the Templars, whose order was founded in Palestine in 1118, 1100s, just keep the dates in mind, we were known to have believed secretly in the unity of all bloodlines, races, religions, let's go, Thomas believes so. He points out that in, in 1184, Wolfram von Etchenbach, a troubadour of the Knight and Knight Templar, who summarized the Holy Grail legends in the Romance of Totoro, that's where we're going to pick up as well with the Preston John series, hints at a spiritual link between the Holy Grail and Asia, or India, and described the Grail as a stone. Let's go. Was Etchingbach Tomas as speaking of Shambhala and the Shintamani stones? And the way they say the Shintamani almost looks like Shinna or China. Right? The Shintamani stones. Right there. Shintamani. Right? China. Shintamani. Because you're in China. That's why we got maps with China. La China. La China. Right around that Mexico area they're calling La China. Let's keep it going. So in the Meisinger's tale, the hero Parsifal carries the sacred cup or stone to Asia, to the kingdom of Totoro, a priest king. What is Prester John? What is the meaning of priester? Prester is priest. Khan or Prester is a meteor priest, right? Dragon priest. Khan, Prester John, John Wong, king. Let's go. Priest king who bears a strong resemblance to the phantom empire emperor of asia who christians call prester john man you read it man what's this got to do with the priest king man we're just talking prester john right we're just talking prester john and i'm on daddy daycare so you know my little ones is, you know, it's about that time man you know what i mean so we're about to get in we're about to get it in so let's go man let's, let's, let's finish this out before they come in here and start busting me upside my head, bone, man. You know what I'm saying? Now let's go, man. So we're saying, they're saying, Victoria LePage is saying that this kingdom of Totoro in this particular, you know, book with these Templars talking about Shambhala and this Shintamani stone, this kingdom of Totoro, a priest king bears a strong resemblance to Prester John. All right, so when you talk to Toro, you're talking Prester John. Now let's keep going. I want to talk about this invisibility and connect it back with David walking on water. Now look, like Shambhala, remember Shambhala is Cibola. Cibola is Kalelus. So when you hear Shambhala, think Kalelus because Kalelus is Cibola, which is Shambhala. Let's go. Like Shambhala, and again, you're talking about realms of energy, not just some place you can just roll up on. You got to be in a frequency to get this stuff revealed, man. You know what I mean? There's layers to this. The mythical kingdom of Prester John was a country full of marvels. It was said to lie in the Gobi Desert to possess a fountain of eternal youth from which all the inhabitants could drink, man. Love to Carameo, who was also dropping, uh, you know, about the fountain, the the jade stone, the 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 jade fountains and all that, man, that has the this life, has the elixir. I think Ty Battle was also dropping on that as well. Only the purest souls 
So again, it has the fountain of eternal youth in Prester John's kingdom or King David's kingdom. Let's go. Remember, they said he had all the drop on the sciences, the magic. He's the greatest magician they ever known, right? So only the purest souls could live in Prester John's land where crime, poverty, and injustice were unknown. The magic mirror enabled the king to observe everything that happened in the world. And what else? Flying dragons, flying dragons, flying dragons carried men for long distances through the air. And a magic ring could make them invisible. Read it. Pause it. Where are we at? All right, here we, at. here we go. So we got flying dragons in Preston John's land, right? Flying dragons carried men for long distances through the air, and a what? A magic ring could make them invisible. Now let's go back to the travels of the doula. What does it say again? King David, remember, he rose in three days. He was put in jail for life. He rose from the dead in three days, and he did what? The king immediately commanded that he should be seized, but his servants answered and said, We see him not, boss. Boss, where you go, boss? We don't see him no more. We see him not. He went invisible and are aware of his presence only by hearing the sound of his voice. So he went invisible, and we're just talking about the what? A magic ring could make them invisible. We're talking about Shambhala. We're talking about Sibola. Man, we're talking about Hazda. And again, in the top of this thing, it says that 10 years ago, there arose a man named David L., all right, who studied under the Prince of Captivity, Hazda. Then, you know, just for fun, I started just thinking about this chronology stuff, man, and, you know, looking at this Hazda. And this link right here, you know, talks about this has died, Ben Shuput. All right. We are just on the investigation. Has died. And it says about a thousand years ago, there lived a, in Spain a great Jewish scholar and statesman called Has Died, uh, born in Gian. Right. <laughs> I can't make it up, man. So he's born, and now they call Jian. Look how they spell this John. J A E N. Jane. All right, we're just talking about Priest King Preston John, right? So they're talking about Spain. And this one says the year 915, or I guess in the Jewish calendar, 4675. So the 900s and all. So we're getting closer. Now he has a father named Isaac, who is the son of Ezra. So it says his father, Isaac, son of Ezra. We're just putting it together. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that his father was the Isaac or that we're talking about the Ezra or the has died, but it seems to start, you know, connecting when you expand a little bit. We're just talking Ezra. Now, Ezra, Ezra here, you know, just put up this link on Ezra. You know, just check it out. Ezra, Ezra. What does it say? Ezra, also called Ezra the scribe, Ezra the priest, all right, a uh, Jewish scribe, priest, they say he's a Kohen, a Kohen, K-O-H-E-N, which we know is a Khan, that they like to just play, like American, they call it Ken instead of Khan, they say Kohen instead of Khan, all right, so he's a priest Khan, all right, priest king. Ezra is also Ezra's, all right, according to the Hebrew Bible, he was a descendant of Sariah, the last high priest to serve in the first temple, and a close relative of Joshua, the first high priest. So we're just connecting this Joshua story, and we're seeing that Ezra is a close re relative of Joshua and his die. Uh, according to this doc here, it says his die, his die, his father Isaac, son of Ezra. So that would make if we look at it straight up, it would make Ezra uh, the grandfather of his die. You know what I mean? We're just connecting it. So if they're saying that this Ezra 
is a close relative of Joshua. That puts Joshua in the same same time frame as you know everything we're talking. Obviously, right? So we're just talking back to the 1200s, 1100s. We're talking Ezra. We're talking this his die here, which of course it says 915. Where are we at? There we go. 915 or the Jewish year 5675. His father Isaac ben Ezra was a great man, a great, a man of great learning and wealth under the care of his father, the young Hizdai, studied the Talmud and later also Hebrew, Arabic, Latin languages in which he became very prominent. Hizdai displayed a special interest in medicine and became a famous physician. Hizdai's great scholarship and especially his fame as a physician attracted the attention of the Caliph. Right, I mean, it's all the stuff we're talking about. The cat, the look, man, let's go back to the Daniel story. So, after he done walked on water, what did the king do? The king of Persia afterwards sent to Emir, the caliph of Baghdad, to do what? Check David. So, the caliph is still in play, and Benjamin of Tadula. With the King David story, here in uh, where we at? Where's my Caliph? Okay, here we go. So back on this link here, man. I'll pull this one back up on his has die, man. Read the second paragraph. Pause it. Read it. Let's go. So the Caliph appointed his die his court physician all right when the caliph became more closely acquainted with his jewish physician and saw that he was a a man gifted right by hawa with great organizing ability statesmanship he appointed has inspector general of customs and his chief diplomatic advisor in his capacity has continued to serve under the caliph as well as his his successor hakam the second who took over the caliphate in the year 4721, which if we add that on the Jewish calendar, that would be another, what's that, 25, 45, 46, on top of that 15, basically 60. So that would take us into about the year 960, closing in on that 1,000 mark, which is right around this time. Remember, his die, or Ezra, close Close, it says in Ezra uh, is a close relative of Joshua, the first high priest. That same link has Ezra as the grandfather of his die. So we're just around that same same area, man. I, you know, give or take, whatever. But we're not way back in the B.C. You know what I'm saying? We're not in the early A.D.s. We're right around that same part where the chronology just told us, man, that Anatoly for the Manko just broke it down. It says, uh, moreover, many of these events prove to be the reflections of certain events from real Byzantine Roman history. Remember, the Roman history is just popping off in the 9th century, according to these chronographers in Russia. And the real history is happening between the 9th and 15th century. So you have a his die around the 900s, you know, could easily be connecting to the 1100 situation with this Joshua or priest king or... Uh, David, you know what I'm saying, popping off in the Benjamin of Tadula. We're just talking Hazai, we're just talking Exilarchs. And we got a couple minutes here, man. Let's uh let's let's talk Kalelus, man. So David's walking on water. It says uh, again that he is studying under his die, according to Benjamin of Tadula. Ten years ago there arose a man of the name David Elroy studying under the prince of captivity now you say well which his die because pull up this link right here back to this genie.com what does it say exilarch has die the six so just because you have a has die you know what i mean on this document that's saying he was born in 915 you know that could be has died at first you know whatever the case is so you know there is a certain you know, wave you got to serve when it says that King David studied under 
has died, well, which one? We know that there was at least six has dies, all right? So could that be taking place between the 900s and up? Because by the time you get to this, his die right here, it said that he was born, estimated, you know, let's see right here, 1302, before 1302. So that's about a 400 year difference. And then if you got six different has dies, which one, which one of them? The King David study under right here. It says he studied under uh, like right there. Uh, he studied under has died, his die, has die. You know, let's go. So which one? Both of these has if he's studying under this excellent scholar has died, and we pull it right here about this learned wealthy has died, alright, then we can definitely start connecting this, especially we're talking about the exilarchs. And this brings us to 1302. Alright. Now, this particular has died. Look down here. Let's get it, man. Let's get it. Making our dismount. Let's get it. This particular has died. It says, is the son of exilarch David, which it says David the six. So, it says that David studied under Hasdai. You know, maybe that was a previous Hasdai. Either way, Hasdai down the road around this time is now Hasdai the six is now the son of Exilarch David the six, Sauslin of Babylon and Georgia. We click on that. What does it say? Read it. This is David, right? David's son is Hasdai to act the Exilarch. We got different sources, man, pointing to this true chronology, true history. We, we got phantoms and duplicates. We got to dodge the hijack. So it says David Exilarch, all right, Soslin, Babylon. We're talking Babylonian captivity, the Exilarchs. Let's go. It says this David is the son of Raja or Raja Chola II or Prester John. Can't make this up. We just talked about Preston John in the Shambhala link. All right. This Preston John here, it says, uh, the Christians called him Preston John. It says, Totoro, a priest king who bears a strong resemblance to the phantom emperor or the mythological King David or who the Christians call Preston John. All right. Prester John, the same David. So David Sauslin is the son of this David or Prester John. Raja here, Raja Chola. We got to get back in the Cholas and the Pandians, man. Connect the drop. But this particular Prester John here had a ring. First, there were flying dragons, we read. Flying dragons carried men for long distances, so our dragons play. We've been talking about the green dragon and all that drop, how that was the um, almost the original emblem of America. Benjamin Franklin actually put it out, like petition, had a whole vote. A lot of people voted to make the green dragon the official symbol of America, but it was, you know, one out by the bald eagle. All you got to do is read o Obadiah 1, you know what I'm saying? Deuteronomy breaks down as swift as the eagle flieth, so that's why the eagle wins, but... They petitioned, Franklin petitioned for the green dragon to be the symbol of America. Why? Because flying dragons in Prester John's land, which is America, remember Amaria, David of Amaria, is America. Flying dragons carried men for long distances through the air, and a magic ring could make them invisible. <laughs> David said, my own wisdom broke me free. And the king immediately commanded that he should be seized. But his servants said, we see him not. We see him not. He disappeared, man. And are aware of his presence only by hearing the sound of his voice. Then he takes off his shawl, walks on water, turns visible. They go to try to catch him. They can't. Now he's sent into the caliph to have his back. This is out the Benjamin of the Dula. We're just talking to Exilarchs. Exilarch David V 
or the six of Sauceland, son of Raja Hiraja, Jadaran, Emperor of Soli, Soli Mon, Prester John, the Pandion. Alright. Man. So he's the father of Hasdai, who it says that David was studying under one of these Hasdais. He's also the brother of Solomon the First. And this is happening estimated before 1302 AD. Again, Genghis Khan invaded you in 1202. Invaded Preston John, invaded. You know what I mean? So this is the son of Preston John. So this is when the war was going down with these exilarchs in this Babylonian captivity. So it's apparent that Genghis Khan has everything to do with the Babylonian captivity story. Just different titles, different names, and in chronology, phantoms and duplicates, which Anatoly for the mango, for the mango, is already giving us the drop. So let's uh let's fall back, man, and just get the last of this right here. You know, this dismount here, about 10 minutes, man, and get into some of these artifacts. Again, this is Kalelu, so Roman Jewish history. In America, right? Amaria, America, from the time of Charlemagne. Again, Charlemagne also called himself David. He believed himself to be connected to the seed of David. All right, throughout the Great. I'm on page 43. Pick it up right here, man. Let's get a couple pages, and I'm going to show you some of these artifacts, these Tucson artifacts coming out of Arizona, man, and around the Four Corners. Now, notwithstanding the crudility or crudity of the Latin and the portrait the portraiture of the crosses. So they're finding all these crosses. Let's read about it. Anyone who directly observes and handles the artifacts cannot but be impressed by the painstaking loving care which wrought them. Then his minutest examination can detect nothing anachronistic in the early medieval style of their paleography or symbolism. Beside the name of the kings, much else on the gun barrel blue, gun barrel blue to light lead gray artifacts confirms the colony to have been Jewish or Israelites. Let's go. A menorah with seven burning candles, a pair of Hebrew goblet chalices, the Habdalah, incense spoons, burning incense, numerals 1 through 10 in double column, surely signify the Ten Commandments. This, These are the artifacts, man, coming out of Kalelus, coming out of Cibola. We're talking the Four Corners and America artifacts. Let's go. So they're Hebrew artifacts, goblets, chalices, or what they call Habdalah. They got uh, these, 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 these commandments rocking. And words in carefully drawn square Hebrew script. So they got the Hebrew script, right? The square, the block Hebrew, uh, including shalom, peace. So they're finding this on the artifact, shalom, kadash, kwadash, gadash, holy, he or it is holy, Elohim, God, goy, godol. A great nation. The colonists eventually represented a heretical Hebrew sect. You know, whenever they say Jewish, you already know Hebrew. Their central symbol of the cross, although not unknown to Hebrew tradition, was a typical. Fred Horton of the Wake Forest Department of Religion recognized in 1971 that two of the crosses, artifacts 18 through and 20, were Nahushtans. Man, when they're talking about Nahusht. Nahusha, Nahushtin, they're talking about the serpent or the the snake or the the dragon. So when they talk Nahush and, and Nahash, man, love to uh Yohanitan Hebrew Prince, man, broke down, you know what I mean, just the wordplay, you know, all the way that to the to the brown driver's bridge. I should bring it out, you know, talking about the Nahash, uh, which you're dealing with a snake or a dragon. Whenever you see serpent, you're gonna have to overstand if you're talking a snake or a dragon because they're both being called serpents and if you're talking flying serpents and if you're talking fiery flying serpents you're just talking dragons again read psalms 18 where it describes the most high breathing smoke out of his nose and fire out of his mouth and flying on the wings of the wind and let's talk dragon let's talk dragon frequencies you know most high can appear in any 
you know what I'm saying, element, frequency, fire, water, air, earth. The most high could be a butterfly, the most high can appear as a dragon. It's no big deal, you know, it's a polymorphing, it's a flow, so it's not to say, oh, your creator is a dragon, nah, but our creator definitely can come in dragon form. Your Prestes, your priests, your Joshua's, your Kamehameha's, man, love to everybody digging in that series, have, you know, come in dragon form, man. So you can't throw that away. Dragons are synonymous with America, which is why Benjamin Franklin was pushing to make that the symbol. Because you're talking about the Akkadian green dragon, or you're talking about Phineas, man. Phineas, man. And love to uh, Freddie B, man. Freddie B gave us some great work on these green dragons, some great work on these American dragons, man, this draconology. And there's so much more in that drug. So let's go. We're talking about the Nehushtan. So on their crosses, it says artifacts 18 and 20 were Nehushtans, man. All right, we're talking dragons, which had ceased to be orthodox from the time King Hezekiah broke the one in the temple that the people were burning incense to. We're having real life script history popping right up. So after the energy of the Dragon energy, as we fell off, we started to symbolize the symbol, or we started to idolize the symbol, these dragon symbols, and, you know, make our own, you know, golden, you know, dragon things and, and worship it. Instead of worshiping the creator, we started worshiping the symbol of the dragon, and the dragon was never here to be worshiped, but to, you know what I'm saying, be a guide, be a bridge to that which is above the barrier in the ether it wasn't that you worship the dragon is that you have an overstanding of fire water ether and the land you don't worship the land you don't worship the fire all right you don't worship the 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 ether you know what i'm saying but you realize that you are these things and you praise your creator for framing and shaping you in the ether in the fire the water the earth but they worship us they they take semblances of us and they say buddha we worship that moses we worship that man that's what that's what happens when you you know what i'm saying lose your focus when you lose your clarity and the etymology of dragon is to do what see clearly so these artifacts got shalom kodash all over them no houston uh they got the uh the dragon drop they say, King Hezekiah broke the one in the temple that the people were burning incense to. In 2 Kings 18, verse 4, that one was the staff with brazen serpent Moses purportedly had used as a snake-biting healing charm. Nah. Nah, man. It was a dragon fire. Remember, Mosai said, whoever this dragon breathes on, man, whoever the, the dragon bites, right? Whoever the dragon breathes on which is a bite to them when you feel that fire, and they will get life. So whoever the dragon breathed on gave you life in the book of Numbers. It didn't give you death. You wanted that dragon breath on you, you know what I mean? Because that's, they were, they were praying. They said, please, Moses, take these dragons away. Take these fiery serpents away, right? That's what it says, fiery serpents. So you're going to have to overstand and say, have I ever seen snakes on fire flying around? Is, is, is that more uh, mythological than a dragon? Because we see dragon bones and they got soft tissue. Check out Mud Fossil University. You know this shit is true. We're reading 2nd Baruch saying the dragons are going to come out of their holes or caves or volcanoes to do what? Submit themselves to a, to a child, to the children. So dragons play, whether you're looking at it in the script or whether you're looking at Merlin and dragons or King Arthur, Camelot and the dragons, dragons, Benjamin Franklin, the green dragons, Phineas, who's in captivity right now in Fort Tryon Zoo, Park Zoo in Upper Manhattan, you got a green dragon in captivity. So we know that's real, but fiery serpents or fiery snakes flying around, that's mythological. You know what I'm saying? So let's go. So here, and it's an example of one of the artifacts, man. And you see this, you know, reptile, right, going around it. 
Snake or Dragon. Let's go. Now it says, uh, the two Nahushtans both repeat the, the elsewhere, repeat the elsewhere occurring bishops cap with Latin L on its side. Number 20 repeats it along the L-I, Lee underneath, which appears on many of the other artifacts. The memorial chronicle crosses prepare us to understand the L or Laudator and Lee, L-I, as Laudator Israel, although other precedents for the I, including Eosephus or Isaacus or Isaac, and Eudas or Judah, otherwise we would have taken it for Libertas or Lex. <laughs> On ancient Roman milestones, it stood for Legionis Imperator. It says the perhaps most provocative recurring symbol found engraved on three swords. So when they say, oh man, you didn't have no iron over here. Uh, these, these people never knew uh, iron and, and metals like they're finding swords buried in Arizona from the 700s, man. So what are the people in the 1200s, you know what I'm saying, had to drop on it? But it was always here in the old times. Maybe it fell off, but it was always here. We had knights, we had swords, <laughs> all of that. So it says these swords on one of the memorial crosses, one of the Nehushtans, and large and clearest of the liberum is a geometric design which seems to have served as the colonial king's coat of arms. It could be the floor plan of the temple or ground plan of its territory, although if the latter, it ought to indicate an irregular contour of the Santa Cruz in relation to the fields, but does not. Man, it's going in. So we're talking about, it says, it in any case exhibits a central square with the projecting smaller square on each side labeled Britannia right, on the west, Romani on the north. It says Gaul or Gaul, G A, looks like a U L E or V L E, on the east, and Terra Incognita Kalelus on the south. All right, we're just talking Kalelus. So this sword, you know, had. You know, some type of a uh, directional drop on it, man. You know, for those that are able to overstand, it had, again, it had Britannia on the west. Remember, Brit just means covenant. Brit just means covenant. Britannia on the west. Romani on the north. We're talking about the Romani, not the Romans. We're talking about the Ramon. Let's go. The Roma, we're talking about the Indies, the Indies, let's go. And it had Gaul, like, like almost like Gaul, G U A G G A U L, but it has G A U L E on the east, and then it has Kalelus on the south, right? This is down the shaft of the sword. Um, and that's the thing, too. I remember uh, some drop about these ancient, you know, ancient weapons, and these were more than just. Some look like crosses, you know, that are really just either swords, broken swords, different things like that. Um, a lot of these things, you know what I mean, are actual technology. And the way the energy would hit these things, they would, you know, light up like Star Wars type of situations, you know what I mean. That's what they're not telling us. They also got some... Well, let's get this part. It says, the puzzling word Kalelus looks Latin, but it isn't unless derived from that barely possible Calabrium synagogue. Otherwise, it is Latinized form of a foreign word. For instance, Qua'al, he has redeemed. Remember, Kalelus just means the promised land, according to Daniel Lowe in the Forbidden Histories of America, man. All right, we're going to keep getting the drop. We're going to keep getting the drop. So Kalelus means promised land, and they're saying it right here. That it's a Latinized form of qual, qual, meaning he has redeemed. All right, pause it. He has redeemed. 
Get all that drop, man. Pause it. Get it, get it, get it. Let's go. Got a couple more minutes. Let's get it, man. So he has redeemed Promised Land. Uh, one of the Nahashtan tags, which would make Kalelus mean something like redeemed land, man. Huh? Huh? Redeemed land. Redeemed land, right? Promised land. We talking Cali. We talking Kalelus in America. Amaria. We talking promised land, B. We talking promised land. So they came over here and made pilgrimages in the promised land. They came to the holy land to make a pilgrimage. And they call them pilgrims, right? Come on, man. So, redeemed land. Other possibilities based on the phonemes. Phonemes, Horton came up with include beautiful land or good land from Greek kalos, good or beautiful, fulfilled, promise from Hebrew kala, kali, kala, to complete, accomplish. Read that right there, man. Fulfilled, promise, promise. So when you talk kalelus, you're talking about a fulfilled promise. Yeah. Fulfilled promise. Fulfilled. Redeem land. Fulfilled promise. Redeem land. Fulfilled promise. Let's go. From Hebrew, Kala. Or country of, or country of the curse. From Hebrew, Kala. To scoff. Right? So you got the flip. To make light of. Well, they definitely cursed us by invading us. So I guess, you know, we can see. We can see clearly. We can see clearly. So they got all kinds of drive, man. I just want to show you a couple more pictures of these artifacts. This is artifact 18, you know. So they got the Nahashtan, you know. So this one in particular, you, know, you can actually see the coil. So, you know, they refer to more serpent, you know, maybe Nahash snakeism, but that might still be referring to the dragon. You know what I mean, we're trying to get the deeper meanings of that. And right here you see the inscriptions that we're coming with, with the Kalelus and different things on them. Romani, you can see Romani if you are able to get that any bigger and clear. Serpent or snake, serpent or snake, huh? Let's see some more artifacts. This is the site of Nine Mile Water Hole on Silver Bell Road, 1971. Oh, these are some of the sites before they started excavating, maybe, in Arizona. Not up, man. All right. The early days of excavations, 1925. All right, so this is uh, three Mexican laborers doing... About to get the excavation on, pulling out these artifacts in case you think it's play play. Another artifact site from 1971. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh man, this particular cross you see Benjamin right in the middle of it. Is it play play? See the crown? You see the rush? The rush? Look at these right here. Artifacts 5A and B. This is where we're getting all this writing on, man. In Arizona. In Kalelus. Is it play play? couple more man you got a sword right here showing diplodocious field a uh, short sword article 12 and on the uh, left you have a spearhead article 10 artifact 10 here's the spearhead here's the sword short sword Alright, we're just talking Kalelus, man. 
We're just talking Kalalas, man. Let's see if there's any more, any more artifacts, man. This is what's this? This is Tuzigut, Tuzigut, 1971. Another spot of a excavation site. And we're just talking Kalalu, so we're gonna get much more in this drop, much more in this book, man. Remember, man, keep supporting the way, man. This is how you support what we're doing, you know. All this goes personally into, you know, keeping us running, man, keeping the radio running, keeping the website running, all that stuff that you're enjoying, man. Keep on supporting it. Drop the shirts, or you know what I'm saying, you can go on the go on the uh website, man, and you know, drop it on our PayPal, man, and help us dodge. Our own hijacks, man. <laughs> and we still got a few more of these. A few more of these snap snap bizzles, man. A few more of these snapbacks, man. So you can get all your gear in the drop, the drop shop, man. Support uh Paco's Kings Oil, oh, man. Get that seed to drop, man. Love the Paco. Support Sister V's hair, body, body butters, you know what I mean? All the soaps and all the stuff that Sister V does, man. Support CJ Battle, man. Hit up uh, crystaljamesjewelry.com and get your crystal pieces, man. You already know I got mine, man. Yay. Yeah, yeah. oh, you already know, man. We cop it up, man. You already know. You already know. We eat it up. We cop it up. I had to actually get you know, find these, you know, two bracelets long enough, man, to make it into a chain, man. Had a good little, you know, folk out here, man, out in Cali, out in Kalalus, you know, to do it, man. I mean, it's a lot of energy, man, coming off these pieces, man. These are pretty good, man. You can get uh, some nice little copper pieces. You see these little joints on the inside, you know, just to kind of, you know, give you that, that energy you need, man. You know, it's all about crystallizing. Remember to Support 24, man. Support the Hakan Jr. You know what I mean? Support the rest of the wave, man. Keep supporting the flow, man. I mean, you dig on it. You know, none of this, you know, you should take and just, you know, go off with and say, oh, you know, this is what I know. We don't present, you know, all the things as something we know. You know what I'm saying? We just let you in, allow you to, you know what I'm saying, take a seat, you know what I mean, in the investigation or, you know, stand up and, and be heard, man. If you want to be a part of the Eat the Squad, maybe you never did, you know, radio before or nothing. But all we do, all we need is an MP3. Our our folk drop their MP3s every week in the Dropbox, man. And we tune it up and we put it on the stream, man. And they have their own slots, man. So, hold up, man. Let me. Where's my Where's my magic book? Let me get my quicker hop, man. Let me give some a hive on the way out of here, man. To Isaac Ford, man. He keeps us tuned up above the barrier. My Jigger, Yosef the Real, RKJ, AD, Yohanna to Hebrew Prince, man. Kara Mayo, my brother X Silence, KB the Hijacker Cezanne, Templar Irvin Reed, Poetry, Ty Battle, CJ Battle, Aqua D, Perky Perspectives. Uh, Con Fresh, man, Brother Nature, Chef Candy, DJ Smooth J, DJ Noski, and of course, man, the Hakan, Hire Mark, man, who brings us right into our Shabbat every Friday night, man. Y'all keep tuning up, enjoy the drop, and yeah, man, King David walked on water. Hawaii.